Okay, a very good morning to all and thanks to all the presenters and participants for being here today and joining our first UNIMAS virtual conference. So welcome to the 13th International UNIMAS Engineering Conference 2020 with the theme of empowering industry and transforming society through engineering technology and management. I am Leonard, a lecturer from uh, Faculty of Engineering, UNIMAS, also a member of ACES Project. We'll be the moderator for today's special track five on social innovation in STEM plus education. So we are indeed very honored to have the ACES Project uh, Malaysian team led by Dr. JC Lin Moy, <laughs> who is today's special track special uh, 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 chairperson. And so thank you very much for agreeing to be part of the uh, NCON 2020 uh, with Dr. JC and the team. So uh, this special track will consist the morning session beginning with the introduction to, uh, to STEM plus education and ACES project by Dr. JC, followed by the sharing on trans uh, technologies in STEM plus education by Dr. Azani Mujahid and Associate Professor Dr. Tan Chong Eng, and pedagogical strategies for deep learning by uh, Associate Professor Dr. Petri Suraya Mohammed and Mr. Chuck Man. So we shall have a lunch break uh, from 12.30 uh, to 2 p.m. And the break, uh, afternoon session will be in the, uh, uh, will be the uh, brain work breakout, followed by the pitch and patch, uh, which I'm sure will be fun. So please stay tuned uh, throughout the, today's session so that you won't miss the fun. So to all the attendees, if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to type it in the chat box where I'll be gathering all the questions to be shared during the Q&A session. So uh, without any further ado, we'll, we'll let uh, Dr. Jesse to take over. Hello, good morning. I will share the slides. To see the slides. Hey, you can see. Yes, yeah, so I'm seeing the presenter slide. Okay. Better. All right. So welcome, um, everyone, to this uh, special track on the Encon 2020 online. Um, good morning to all the participants. Uh, thank you, Chair Besson, uh, for introducing and inviting us to uh, this special track. Uh, also, today we are going to share to you about the introduction to social innovation uh, on STEM, in STEM plus education. I am Jessilyn from Unimas. And before we start, it would be lovely to actually get uh, participants to tell us where you are from, you know, which exotic city or country you're from. Okay. So please feel free to type in the chat so at least we know where you're from. And then, <clears throat> yes, we have a, a total of actually 182 participants registered uh, to this special track. Uh, majority are teachers from what we have gathered, educators from schools, colleges, universities, NGO, industry, consulting firms, parents, and even in interested individuals. So we have gathered, uh, they are members from Indonesia, they are part of our ACES uh, team. Uh, so, yep, thank you, and also all Malaysians, thank you so much. As you can see from the word, uh, we have a lot of participants from SCOLA, uh, Kebangsaan Primary School, and it's uh, either from public primary school as well as uh, private primary school. That's what we have gathered. Thank you again for joining us today. So today we'll be discussing, uh, sharing with you on my session, uh, who we are, and uh, what is the, what do we do, and that will lead to what social innovation is, especially in STEM plus education. We will also give a brief what is STEM plus. Uh, education and as well as today's program. So, in brief, I'm sorry about the, the slides, a bit slow. So, in brief, 
we are actually um, <coughs> from uh, ASUS Team Malaysia. It is, it has a mind on its own, I'm sorry. Uh, we are ASUS Team from uh, Unimas. And yes, sorry about it. Again, it, it keeps on popping up. Uh, the ASUS team is in Malaysia as well as in the UK, uh, Vietnam, and, uh, and Indonesia. So we collaborate together with four different countries. Uh, and yes, and I will, I will briefly introduce to you our work as well. So we are actually at the Gamification Center in Unimas. So you can always follow us at the website. And then these are our team. Okay. So we come from multidisciplinary ASUS team. So most of us are educationists, learning sciences, network scientists, engineers, GIS, analysts, computer scientists, as well as a marine biologist. So why do we have all these mixed multidisciplinary uh, team members? Because we're looking at the SDGs uh, from climate change, to uh, smart cities, to clean water, uh, to improving the quality education. Okay, so the ACES project aims to investigate the transformative education to developing social resilience. So that's what we're looking at, as you can see on the most right hand side. So we're looking at using playful pedagogy as well as Google methodology. And again, our partners are Malaysia, the UK, Vietnam, and Indonesia. And aligning with the UK SDG on equitable, inclusive quality education, and that's why we are all here today, we are looking at developing an innovative pedagogy model, which will be introduced today, a few of the models, and its associated programs of playful, experimental, co-creative, and participatory activities. The aim of this model that will be developed is actually to bridge the formal and informal education context and as well as space. So we will not only looking at uh, classroom contacts, but we will also be looking at outside classroom and getting teachers as well as students and communities, universities, all working together uh, in building the youth as well as the community, the parents of the youth to an inclusive, safe and resilient society. Right, so the ACES team, as you can see, what is it for Sarawak, as we all know that Sarawak is moving towards the Sarawak Digital Economy Agenda, uh, IR 4.0, the emergence of uh, the industrial revolution, Education 4.0 comes in, and that was initiated by the World Economic Forum and desired to approach to learning. So what is Education 4.0? It's aimed to create common agenda to transform primary and secondary education systems to ensure future readiness among uh, the coming and the next generations of talents. The initiation will drive impact through four connected, uh, connected interventions. So as you can see, we will be looking at uh, reskilling, upskilling teachers, as well as students, as well as educators, and even individuals, whoever stakeholders would want to be involved I would want to move further in uh, the next generation in, in transforming into uh, what we call a transformation change to becoming um, the 21st century citizens. We are also looking at a global framework of transforming or shifting the content of learning and mechanism by which it is delivered more closely mirrored to the needs of the future as well as the needs of the community as things has evolved with the given technology, as well as the current pandemic. And now that we're even moving into using a webinar instead of a face-to-face -face conference. So in highlighting the new policy pathway to enable this Education 4.0, we'll be working together with stakeholders. And these stakeholders are not just teachers, not just you and I, not just university, but we will also work together with NGOs, government, because we are all a community in this whole world system in order to improve the delivery of curriculum and enhancing pedagogy. Every stakeholder, every member, all the helix pedagogic um, system has to work together to ensure this all works. And with this, we could build 
a marketplace for connectivity, collaboration, and learning between school and student systems across the world. Okay. So in hope, we will be able to untap talents among teachers and students, especially in Malaysia, to ensure that we do not lose out the risk to achieve IR zero. So next, we'll be going to introduce to you what STEM is. Okay. So STEM Plus, as the web says, the PLUS is an acronym, incorporates the application of ICT and media technologies, co-creation, thinking methodology, design thinking uh, approach into the traditional STEM discipline. So it has been shown and it has been researched and mentioned that technology actually supports education and could improve students' learning outcomes, including higher order skills. And these are all through learning by doing. So these are the current labor market data in Malaysia that we have captured, even in the world. Yeah. So labor market has shown that cognitive knowledge is required, skills are required, abilities associated with STEM education are in demand. So it is not just traditional STEM occupation. We are no longer building factory workers we are building uh, 21st century skilled workers, and this can be done through STEM education. In a high school level, in both rural and uh, urban communities, and across all nations, uh, well, in, in the whole of Malaysia, uh, many students are not even provided with the extra courses, technologies that they need to develop and deepen their mathematics science, skills, and knowledge. So these are the few issues that we have captured. And this could be due to the boundaries, you know, political boundaries, uh, racial boundaries, all these exist. And this would cause inequality in assessing the right sort of education or the success of STEM education or STEM in STEM subjects. So interestingly, Again, these gaps are not new. You know, the market, uh, low, level, uh, low market, uh, labor market, as well as the gap in STEM. Uh, these gaps are definitely not new. They reflect a long-standing pattern in resource allocation. Teachers or uh, even educators in university are saying there's no funding, not enough resources being allocated. And therefore, the students' performance and access to all these resources in STEM uh, is decreasing, uh, could be decreasing. And this is widely acknowledged, not just in Malaysia, not just in Sarawak, but as well as all around the world. So in STEM, the funding availability of high-quality programming continues to also be inconsistent. There are certain areas that get uh, funding for resources, there are certain areas that do not get funding for resources. And therefore, strong STEM pedagogy are required. And at the moment, could be lacking, could not be lacking, but if there is a lack, uh, there is a need to have a strong STEM plus education pedagogy. So in order to understand uh, all these STEM education, they are also limited familiarity and understanding among public with the acronym of STEM. The word STEM has been over STEM. And the misconception about STEM education, STEM plus education, when to use it, how to use it, and who to teach all these disciplines. These are all issues. But these are common issues that we can't run away from it. So in light of this unfamiliarity about STEM education, STEM instruction remains in the current practice in traditional course classrooms that place math as a basic, science in secondary, technology and engineering as a supplement add-ons uh, to later for some of the students. Of course, there is an important difference in STEM disciplines in order for our students, educators, to fit in the real world. And therefore, researchers suggest that interdisciplinary approach can enhance student learning for better model STEM processes in real world. 
interdisciplinary approach. Teachers can't work or stand on their own. The schools cannot be on their own. The schools will have to work with communities, the schools will have to work with universities, and that is where all of us will come hand in hand to work together and ensure that STEM plus education would work. It is also therefore perceived, you know, the, the elitism of STEM discipline. Oh, you are from the science side, you are from the art side. All these disciplines of STEM fails to recognize actually the benefit of STEM education in promoting a higher level critical thinking skills and lifelong social engagement, regardless of students' post-secondary plans or career ambition. So let's hope that STEM uh, discipline doesn't limit to STEM discipline, that we would also get the arts in, we will also get language in, we will also get culture in, into that STEM. So therefore, it is the aim of today's workshop, today's track, is that we would share with you, or perhaps we would find some innovation and critical access to high quality learning experience. So it is uh, fortunate to say that uh, the research team in, in Unimas were going on full gear to really understand what is the world looking at in terms of STEM education, where does the world stand, and how can we move Malaysia together with this same forward progress of STEM. So in our workshop, even in our you know, talk, uh, feel free to continue chatting, continue to ask, post your questions, which we will answer later on at the end of all the talks and every single session in the afternoon session as well. Allow yourself to also start a conversation. Okay? There are a lot of opportunities for social innovation. Do not be afraid to the term innovation. Everybody innovates. When light bulbs are broken, we innovate with a different light bulb that may look pretty or may function for a different purpose, with brighter lights or darker lights of different colors. So give us a, an opportunity to talk about all the possible social innovation. We can talk about water quality, we can talk about climate change, and that we will work together in motivating one another in achieving this transformative change. So social education and social innovation comes hand in hand, right? So it's a new pathway for educational model. For instance, if you look at uh, social innovation, the word social comes from society. So we have to learn to work together with community and society. And with that, we could actually achieve the 21st century. So we are still focusing on quality education. We're looking at uh, building the 21st century skills, and creativity, uh, critical thinking. I'm sure all teachers, educators are experiencing this, even those who are working in industry listening to us right now. We also find that these skills are lacking. But lo and behold, we don't need to be wary. This can be trained, untrained and retrained and upskilled. All these and hopefully, uh, our students and individuals can be innovative and also be an entrepreneur. Okay. So, in general, social innovation in education and lifelong learning and beyond can benefit from new opportunities uh, provided by technology. If, for instance, one can include playful biogamification while fostering digital literacy at the same time, meaning you can use games, uh, game-based learning, and the overall of gamification, together with your knowledge in digital, you can use WebEx as we use today, or you can use uh, any different applications, um, Kahoot, for example, gamifying Kahoot, and this could create a new practice, uh, as well as learning context using adequate digital uh, devices. The examples of trend and technologies will be presented in the next talk, and they will be focusing on the establishment of different and completely new practices in education. Uh, 
The speakers will also focus on changes in education beyond existing costs and approaches that is linked to the establishment of social innovation, building on a more holistic and bottom-up perspective on grassroots, integrating all relevant stakeholders There are also potential strategies, example, co-creation, whereby you would have a first hands-on that could provide a leeway to social innovation. That will be in the afternoon sessions. They will call this design thinking, radical, disruptive thinking concept, which is commonly, commonly, uh, which is usually or commonly used in industries in the West. It's uh, often absent from the structure of formal education. It's a recognition that hands-on experience is needed whereby we should allow our students to experience failure. I know it is a taboo, but from learning what failure is, what we learn to be successful. Here, play is a central role in learning academic subjects. Learning failure can be incorporated in play. Okay, so intentional play activities can support this type of learning experience by providing students with time to explore the uncertainty, construct knowledge from experience, and strengthen relationships between their peers as well as the teachers. And major the teachers will be good things outside classroom in their class, and they work together with communities. I reckon the world will be a better. So with that. I would like to say thank you for listening uh, to to my talk this morning. I'll, I'll be introduced well the introduction today. Uh, do keep an open mind, and I hope that you will find that the next following session today benefiting and enlightening to you all. So any questions again will be answered at the end of these three sessions. So please post your questions in the chat box. Uh, if we have the time, we will definitely have the time. We will answer all the possible questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jesse, for the very uh, eye-opening talk. Okay. Uh, so next, uh, next we will call on uh, Dr. Asani. As uh, associate professor of the Tanjong Eng, to talk about uh, uh, trends and technologies in STEM plus education. So, if, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, share with us over the uh, chat, and then we will get to it uh, later. Okay, uh, while waiting for uh, the next presenter, yeah, uh, by the way, um, uh, later on there will be a, a question and answer again, uh, if you have anything uh, that you want to ask. Uh, yes, uh, this session is recorded, so uh, we will put the uh, link to the video uh, uh, at the end of the session. Later. Uh, this is to answer to Zalia Hakim, Zaini.
しゃべる。Hello, I welcome to those I need. Hello? Hello. Okay. Okay, welcome to those I need. Hi, can you see our presentation screen? Is the title?、Um, not yet, we, we're still seeing you. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. The session is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning to our participants who are joining us from wherever you are today. I hope you are、um, safe.、Um, thanks to the conference organizers for having us. And I'd like to especially thank the ACES project as well for inviting me and、um, a doctor. Dr. Tan to speak.、Um, uh, shout out to our sponsors, the Global Challenges Research Fund, that have believed in the impactful work that's being done here in UNIMAS towards transformative education、um, through playful approaches and experiences. So,、uh, the presentation session today is actually divided into two.、Um, uh, I will cover a little bit about the trends and technologies. And、um, Associate Professor Dr. Tan will、um, be delving into the case studies of ICT adoption projects that have been done with the Ongang ASEAN community. If you do a very quick、um, question search on, on Google, what do you get when you type in trends and technologies in STEM education in Malaysia? In less than a second, you get over a million hits. So there's Numerous recent materials that are available, lots of journal papers as well as opinion topics, have been written devoted towards、um, trends in STEM technologies and different STEM domains、um, at all different education levels from、um, K to,、uh, to university.、Um, oftentimes, a lot of material becomes overwhelming and it's、uh, unpractical as well because not all. Um, um, advisories may be adopted for our local context. So, there's extensive literature al already available, and I'll just sum summarize into very、uh, quickly four main domains、um, of trends for our consideration and discussion. So, firstly,、uh, STEM subject teachers have to deliver、um, their material, and they're no longer confined to traditional. Uh, ways of delivery or problem solving techniques. And there is a, a big need now to enhance a lot of this critical thinking and adopting of these new techniques, including co creation, which、um, the previous speaker JC had mentioned,、um, to solve a lot of the problems, which are、uh, future problems. And delivering of this material、um, has to concurrently improve the students' motivation. So the students have to feel like they, they are buying into this. New techniques of learning,、um, as well as parents,、um, have to understand that a lot of the new technologies are catered for future learning, not the way we used to traditionally learn. And this helps to improve a lot of these new abstract concepts,、um, and that can happen organically. And、um, secondly,、uh, there are many new innovative trends in the teaching and learning processes, but in terms of a local context, What would work? For example, if you're, if you're having soft、um, topics such as gender inclusivity or leadership in, in schools,、um, diversity among teachers, or teachers now play a different role. They, they tend to be expert facilitators, facilitating and curation of the knowledge. And a lot of times, some of the work like What has been done with ACES, with the flipped learning as well. Some teachers may be familiar with that.、Um, it becomes that the, the teachers are, are curating the knowledge that the students develop organically themselves from their own, own reading and experience. So, thirdly,、um, there's expensive and growing access to ICT tools.、Um, 
And this begins even from children who are very young and three years old age, for example. Um, I've been to villages where children three years old have um, parents and grandparents that do not speak English, but the children sound like Peppa Pig, right? So this is actually um, growing in a lot of our rural villages where the access to uh, technology has allowed the children to learn at an expensive rate beyond what we are familiar with. Now, STEM gains the same prominence with the children from early childhood education. Um, and this begins very early and grows towards until university stage where a lot of material is available online for lifelong learning through MOOC or FutureLearn. I think many are familiar already with this um, platform, educational platform. Right? So, and, and lastly, the fourth, um, um, third and fourth point I'd like to make are the power of the social media. Social media and social networks are very obvious in a lot of the youth movements nowadays. Um, the one very clear highlight is um, Greta Thunberg. A lot of people are quite familiar with her. Um, the climate justice movement among the, the youth was very powerful, and they even had space to speak in the United Nations. And um, a growing one in, in recent weeks uh, with the Milk Tea Alliance. Um, it's an online democratic uh, solidarity movement, which has a lot of youth netizens um, up in arms from um, Hong Kong and Taiwan and Thailand. And the, the youth have found they can grow a lot of soft skills through uh, online platforms. Um, they learn skills such as advocacy, um, negotiation, and improve their community skills. Communicative skills are one of the hardest to teach in school, and online platforms actually allow this new age of communication to happen. And so, STEM knowledge, STEM plus knowledge, uh, including the growth of languages, uh, has improved greatly with uh, young and the youth, um, also through Netflix, uh, YouTube, and, and this is not uncommon anymore. Um, a question that I always ask my students when they enter my class would be, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's quite common that the answers now are maybe shocking to us, but it's quite common that I hear answers such as, I want to be an influencer. Now, these are jobs that did not exist in our vocabulary in the last five to 10 years, right? These are all very new. And um, these are one of the top dream jobs among our youth today. Now, we can't look at influencers as just people who sell makeup or they're selling products. A lot of influence are, influencers are also STEM influencers, STEM class educators. Um, for example, David Attenborough, who is a traditional uh, uh, speaker in documentaries, has now moved towards uh, the use of Facebook to answer questions and engage with young learners. And so um, the influence of um, uh, the social media and uh, online channels, uh, it's, it's growing uh, rapidly also in Malaysia. Now, this fits well into the growth of uh, future jobs. According to the World Economic Forum, around the world, um, future jobs, up to 133 million workers, uh, will be in this emerging new roles, right? The new kinds of jobs that we probably have not heard before. So we are actually training students to be ready for future jobs that may not yet exist. And this is heavily concentrated on specialists that deal with relationships of big data, relationships with technology, machine learning, um, and professionals who are involved in then human relations as well, uh, in sales or in customized services. The top five skills in demand um, in, the, in the near future would be communication, ability to work as a team, uh, problem solving, leadership, and strong work ethics. And um, today, these are feedbacks that we often get from employers as well, that the youth are not ready for jobs because these skills are not yet perfected. So in the new ways of learning, um, what is expected, right? Um, if you look at the, the, um, the definition from the Malaysian Education Blueprint, um, student-centered approaches 
um, aligned to this 21st century skills, um, such as communication, critical thinking, values, ethical applications, um, are really pivotal to our, our children to learn. And there's a big gap here. Um, edu are educators agile enough to teach these new skills? Are they equipped to teach these new skills at a fast enough pace, keeping up with technology as well and expectations of the learner? So what can teachers do? Um, I got this picture last night from um, David Attenborough's tweet. Um, and he highlights the, th the tree that doesn't give up. And I feel that teachers are very much like this tree, right? Um, even when you're faced with challenges, uh, naturally teachers will adapt and they continually grow and they grow stronger. And I think this is uh, where teachers in Malaysia uh, very show their dedication, right? The dedication to change according to that other needs of the country. And, and so teachers entering this new uh, role where they are starting to curate uh, delivery of their assessments um, using tools which are preferred by learners, um, which have uh, uh, matching to internet stability, uh, which take into account how much bandwidth use the students have and how much technology the students have, as well as new techniques such as gamification. Um, before we start the class, I would actually encourage that students, um, a teacher, sorry, um, try to do this survey test for students to see how they like to learn. And then the common answers, such as in my own classes, are they like to watch videos, they still like to read text and read comments online. Uh, they like to do discussions with group works and uh, quizzes as well as assignments. So continuous learning is still very popular. So then I try to do um, walls such as, uh, sharing walls such as in Answer Garden where um, I can pose a question and students can answer. You can have a look at these later. We will attach the um, 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 sites so you can have a look at how the sites are. Um, you can also use sharing walls such as Padlet to um, get information of, uh, uh, like for example, where they are. And social media, I think it's also still very powerful. A lot of students prefer using WhatsApp for con conversation so they feel close with the educator or YouTube channels such as like what uh, Kiman has is also very popular because then um, uh, YouTube doesn't take too much bandwidth. I tend to also use QR codes such as, for example, Q code, uh, QR code monkey. Um, so it's easy for parents to, who may not be able to, to read and write to actually just scan the QR from their, their phone and the, the parents can open the pages for their students. Um, and then I'll go very quickly into the gamification of learning. Um, these are some websites that exist. Um, I, I teach marine science and, and um, there are a lot of games that are freely available online. And so teachers don't feel that they need to create all the time. They can actually adapt a lot of material that's uh, already available. So these uh, few websites are just examples. Um, Reschool, for example, teaches about um, the marine environment and how Nemo what Nemo needs to grow. And there are different types of fun games that are available for all different levels. And you can learn a lot of STEM concepts from these. Right? You learn about colors. Or, so in art, you also learn about um, spectrum of color. And this is also found in, in STEM websites. Um, I also have used um, 3D printed models. I think these ones, if you have access to a makerspace where the teachers can print 3D models, that's also something teachers can look uh, towards to creating their own material. Um, besides the uh, typical games that are available, so this is one game that's made by Malaysians, for Malaysians, so it's a Malaysian context game. Uh, teachers can think about that. How do you want to create content that is suited for the local context? Um, this happens a lot in, our, in the gamification lab, the gamification center here. Um, uh, under the creative culture uh, project, a sister project for eight phases. And um, they try to create games that help the students to, to learn for local context. So um, I'm coming to the last uh, slide before I pass on to uh, Dr. Tan. Um, so teachers can work towards curating tools that are specific for, the, for their own needs. 
and it can be meaningful to engage students this way using tools that are suited to them uh, for their own learning local context. So thank you very much. I'll pass on to um, the next speaker here. Um, if there's anything, just please leave a note um, on the chat box and we'll try and get back to you later. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Dazani. All right, so good morning, and this is Tan Chong Eng. I would like to continue the session by sharing the case studies on adopting ICT as tools for learning and uh, development. And ICT adoption shares similar nature with STEM education. And it's just that when it comes to ICT adoptions for the rural community, the approaches used have to be adjusted in order to achieve the desired outcome, as well as following the technology, allowing the technology itself to be usable for a long uh, period of time. Here, uh, I would like to share some of our previous experience on ICT adoptions implemented through the Telecenter program for Ora Asli in West Malaysia. In short, we call this TPOA. And researchers' engagement with the Orang Asli communities were started as early as 2011. The official project situation was from 2013 to 2018, but of course various activities are still ongoing until today. So the, uh, the TPO project covers a wide scope and it was a multidisciplinary project involving not only technologies such as engineering and computer scientists, but also social scientists, educators, and health specialists. The main objective was to bridge the digital divide between the remote rural and the urban, uh, whereby the facilit uh, this thing is to facilitate uh, communication, and also to provide access to useful information. Through these projects, telecenters are used as rural transformation centers to uh, drive rural developments, and it is also a resource center for knowledge and skills to provide education via ICT, to provide training for local capacity building, and to provide health-related information. And of course, there are actually five specific government programs riding on top of the ICT infrastructures to uh, utilize uh, social and economic developments in the Ora Asli community. Oops. Going backwards, sorry. So the uh, there were four Orang Asli communities being selected with the help from Jabatan Kemajuan Orang Asli and two at Pahang State, namely Post Sintu and Post Lenjang, another two at Kelantan State, namely Post Kop and Post Bala. The main reason they were selected was due to the extreme remoteness and uh, the ICT adoption could possibly bring the biggest uh, impacts on the community. Yes, remoteness is the great challenge here. Uh, all the sites, at least uh, during the early stage of projects, uh, there were physically challenging to assess. There were some access road improvement at post Sintro after some time, but uh, for the rest of the site, the access is still uh, as challenging. The access roads are not always accessible due to many factors such as uh, broken bridges, landslide, and too high the water level for the uh, four wheels uh, drive vehicle to, to cross. And the journey is always very costly, dangerous, and you can be trapped in the middle of nowhere if unlucky. Participatory approach is actually one of the important methodologies used in TPOA projects. And the uh, participation of local community started even before the project proposal. The needs for telecenter in the community has been discussed for numerous times as to motivate and to engage. For long-term sustainability, the uh, sense of belonging and the actual needs of the community must be addressed by the telecenter. Hence, start from telecenters building and planning, there were locations, uh, sorry, yeah, the location and the construction of the telecenters were decided and carried out by the respective local community. For all other stages, such as ICT system, installations, operations, maintenance, training, and troubleshooting, the community is also closely participated. 
Each telecenter building was uniquely built, whereby the project supplied some of the uh, non-organic building materials such as cement, metal road, etc. All the other materials such as wood and bamboo were sourced locally by the local community. The uh, community gathers and form working groups for the task, which shall bring greater sense of belonging to the telecenter and uh, at the same time empowering the community sector. On top of that, communities develop capacity to build houses because uh, they do not get used to build uh, permanent houses like this. They used to bamboo houses, uh, so they will get to develop these skills, and of course, they will also develop a stronger unity through group work. So, telecenter caretakers uh, that has been elected from the local communities will be involved in the installation, operation, and maintenance of the ICT system. Uh, this part of the participation is crucial as the future ICT system operation and maintenance are to be carried out by them. There's no other uh, support because we, we cannot always be there to support them. So they have to do it all by, by, all by themselves. They are the champion of the developments to the local community for ICT adoptions and also the key personnel for sustaining the operation which include providing routine maintenance. Training. Uh, training is essential for ICT adoptions across the community. The best trainer shall come from the community itself. Hence, the local elected caretaker that has been trained with sufficient knowledge will make great trainer owing to they understand the local needs better and they do not have language barrier when conducting training for the rest of the community. Because for us, when we conduct in Bahasa, they, they are still having problems to understand. So the best trainer is still by the communities. So when it comes to troubleshooting of ICT system problem, through the guidance provided remotely by us uh, from the urban, through some ICT communication systems, then they can develop capacity to self sustain the telecenter and to ensure continuous operations. And lastly, we have a question here for you, for all educators, is that uh, if you are to put up with such challenging uh, remote rural environments, as an educator, so what are the things that you can do to enable your students to participate in STEM plus education? So this is a point to ponder. So just imagine yourself in such scenario. So what should you do? And uh, yeah, and thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, I think it's good that you leave it at the uh, uh, at the chat uh, session so that we will rest, we will get back to you. And that's all for this session. Thank you very much. I think our next session will start in a few minutes time. It's not according to time. Thank you, Selena. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azani and Dr. Tan. So, uh, so we uh, while waiting for the uh, next presenter, what I will do is that I will play a video, about three minutes video, uh, for for you guys to have a view of what we have uh, has been done before this.
All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the next session. Um, today, no, I'll be continuing with uh, Dr. Petri next to me. My name is Lucky Man, you can call me Kiman. So uh, we'll be sharing more on the pedagogy, pedagogical strategies for deep learning. Um, you may have heard of deep learning from the IT perspective, which is uh, kind of like machine learning, but we're not talking about that deep learning. We're talking more we're focusing more on the, uh, the, the the deeper learning part that we can do in our normal day-to-day uh, -to -day teaching for, in the classroom. So um, I'm going to start off with some introduction, and then, as I said, Professor Dr. Petrus Raya will continue with the, some of the strategies that you can kind of consider in your uh, teaching and learning in order to adapt on um, how to put it. deep learning in your um, teaching and learning, okay? So just a quick overview of what is happening now. Uh, I think we kind of know like what Dr. JC had mentioned earlier. The STEM education in Malaysia is getting a bit of uh, bad perception or uh, I would say slightly bad press, uh, especially in terms of how it is done in schools because we know that there is a declining interest in STEM education or STEM subjects across uh, all levels of education since you know primary school, secondary school, even up until tertiary education. I think we feel it even in universities. You get students who switch from sciences to to the arts or humanities uh, with the understanding that STEM subjects are difficult or they just can't cope with the need of uh, you know all this uh, high level or high order thinking. I, I, you know, higher order thinking. So um, we are also in the uh, dilemma of looking at how the whole education system is structured in Malaysia in a way STEM subjects like all other subjects are kind of structured in an examination mode where a lot of students are pressured to take science subjects uh, by maybe by the parents or even by the school just to perform in um, the exam, you know, PMR, PT3 now, uh, even in SPM or STPM. Even some schools limit students from taking STEM subjects just in, you know, just to protect the percentage of passing in, in, across the, the, you know, the statistics that they get every year. So I think it's not an encouraging sign. Then number three, of course, uh, STEM subjects are taught by non-option teachers and this has caused a lot of problems as well. And uh, Dr. Jesse had mentioned that earlier in, in her presentation. So what can be done uh, in the global context, uh, apart from the local context that we, we mentioned just now, um, I think you see this list like over and over again. Uh, I saw the one for top 10 skills of 2020, and then you see the same thing with being repeated, you know, uh, analytical thinking, uh, innovative, innovative thinking, uh, critical thinking, creativity, all this uh, has been around for quite some time. But this time around, the World Economic Forum kind of grouped them into four main types. You can see in the slides there. And uh, all four are not that easy to be done if we do not try to use a different kind of approach or a different kind of pedagogical strategy or else we'll be repeating the same thing over and over again. So what can be done? Well, one of the strategies that we can look into is, of course, the new deep learning pedagogy. Or, well, it's not really new, but the name was called new deep learning uh, pedagogy before that by Pullen and Lang uh, worthy, they, they created this kind of diagram to explain what they meant by uh, deep learning. So uh, just to give you an overall understanding of what it is, the old pedagogy is just we have the content knowledge, we have the pedagogical capacity, we have the technological uh, tools, but what was done was just to deliver the content, pass the exam, and then that's it. But in a deep learning kind of approach, you don't just do it for the sake of passing the content from A to B. You do it by giving them opportunity to get more autonomy or uh, empowerment in terms of their, their learning. So I'm going to pass to Dr. Petri now to, to, to explain further on what deep learning uh, is about, and then uh, we'll see how it can help you in your teaching and learning. Okay. Um, 
Hello, Assalamualaikum. Um, very good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us, and um, thank you to Encon for um, inviting us to present to you, um, for all of you today. And um, we are. I'm going to continue a bit about um, uh, deep learning, which which Kimar has started just now. Um, when we talk about deep deep learning, it's about the um, the way we um, pitch. Um, our teaching, yeah. It's um, how how do we make sure that um, the, the the learning comes to a point where um, the students become self motivated. The, the students see the point of why they are learning something, and I think this is missing in a lot of our classrooms because um, we when we look at um, the syllabus, sometimes we tend to see the syllabus being like. Um, a, a, a small bit out of a small, uh, out of a bigger um, picture, and sometimes the connection that we make between the topics that we teach uh, may not be apparent for the students. And this is the reason why um, I think a lot of students lose interest and they don't see the point of why they're learning. Um, when we talk about when we talk about deep learning, um, th these are what we found from uh, reading here yeah, on 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 this pedagogy. But to be honest with you, they are not anything new. And and um like character education, we have been using this um in, in our uh, system pedidikan Malaysia for the longest time. Um all of our curriculum has always been geared towards building the holistic individual and 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 being honest, being self regulated, being responsible, all these um um values are already there in our curriculum. Citizenship we have always um, uh, aligned our um, education system to the Rukun Negara. And, and th this has been inculcated in the way that we choose um, the topics that we teach, the context in which uh, we present our uh, content, and also the way that um, uh, we, we want to we wanna get people to, to, to love the country because of the things that they're learning in school. And, and communication, critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, all this is, is part and parcel. It, it takes a central role in our Malaysian education blueprint. And, and this is not something which is completely new. It's just, I guess, old wine in new bottles. But um, it, it, it's a nice um, departure um, for people who may not um, know how important it is to make a link between all these things um, uh, that in a way it would affect um, the uptake in, in science and technology and in mathematics. And, and even in UNIMAS, we see this as well, that um, we, are, we are losing um, candidates applying for our science stream um, uh, programs here. So, um, I'm, and I'm sure this is also a trend that we're seeing in all other universities as well. Um, you know, how do we do this? How, how, what, what are the things that we need to think about? Um, number one, we suggest looking at um, restructuring the way that we, we, we want learning to happen. So the learning experience um, is, is contextualized in a way that the students um, see the point. Yeah, it's not just achieving the learning outcomes that we have um, um, listed out for the, um, for, for, for the session, but rather to see, okay, if, if I do this, how does this inform um, what I will learn the next day and the next month? And, and this mastery of content can, can literally be built um, as and when we are able to communicate this with the students. Um, the, the next bit is on um, allowing um, students to create and also to use new knowledge. And, and we see this a lot in our projects. Um, almost all of our team members um, in ACES, um, we have all gone down to the ground and we have worked with um, remote rural communities all over Sarawak and Sabah. And, and what we see is that children are, are not afraid to learn new things. It's just a matter of um, putting the, the construction of that learning experience in a way that they will be able to use it to progress in their own communities. And, and this, this is something that uh, we have to be brave. We have to take a risk in order to um, enable this to happen, this, this opportunity to happen. Um, the next bit is about showing the why. So rationalizing 
yeah, the content that we are teaching, the content um, that we want them to, to learn. I think this is where um, we help them make the link from one topic to another topic to another topic, even in the way that we choose the examples that we use in class, link it to what, what they understand. I'm not saying that you have to use, um, you know, every other lesson, you have to use a TikTok um, example, but um, relate to them. Yeah, make it relatable, make the content relatable, show them why it is important to learn that content that you're teaching. So in, 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 in that sense, they, they, they begin to build um, a, a um, how do you say this? Um, it's like they're looking forward to what will be presented in the next lesson, in the next lesson, and this will um, obviously increase your motivation to learn. Um, we talked about um, shared mental model a lot in, in our classes in, in the Masters in Learning Science in Universe. Um, shared mental model talks about um, how people uh, come together and collaborate. Now, in, in any collaboration, the most important thing is you need to have the language to talk to people. Um, a lot of times I see even my students at, at master's level, they struggle to um, uh, discuss effectively with each other because of the lack of um, language, because of the lack of um, understanding of um, words. So um, when, when this happens, the collaboration breaks down. Yeah, what, what we need to do is to foster this collaborative um, learning environment uh, to happen so the students are able to make substantive um, and also negotiated decisions together. To be able to do this, they need to understand what their peers are, uh, uh, what their peers would know, yeah, so that they can build upon um, that knowledge and create new knowledge um, as, as they go along. Leveraging on digital tools, I think this is said, I think, more than, <laughs> more than um, you know, uh, but it's um, something that we constantly need to take risks and um, to learn all the time to, like what Dr. JC said, um, to learn, relearn, and unlearn, um, especially now that we're in the pandemic, nobody comes to class and everybody has to you know, learn new skills in, in teaching. Um, for those of us who are shy in front of a camera, you have to face the camera to teach the students. So these are all new skills that um, I guess in training, we were not even taught. Um, but I think digital tools are, are here to stay. And, and it is not something that we should be afraid of. Um, and we should learn to um, use whichever that, that fits. Um, the way that we teach, yeah? It doesn't mean that we use um, all tools in order to, you know, entertain. I, I, I always remind my students that when we teach, uh, remember that you're not an entertainer, yeah? You're, you're here um, uh, to, to make them engage, but it's not about, you know, coming up with um, um, entertaining elements all the time. Yes, it can be fun, it can be interesting, but at the end of the day, it's the content that they leave um, from the classroom that, that you want them to, to, to have, yeah? So, um, and I think this slide is about um, how um, the usage of technology can drive um, the articulation of new knowledge. And this is what we want our students to be able to do when they leave um, our, our courses, our classes, the subjects that we teach, yeah? Like for instance, developing simulations and animation, these are all high level um, technical skills. But if they are interested and they understand enough about the content, they would be able to do this, yeah? Um, finding information on the internet, which is the last one um, in, in the basic use um, list here, Almost and everyone can do it. You know, this is not something that is um, too challenging or, or too risky for them. But we, we try to um, get students to go up in this um, list where it goes towards um, knowledge creation rather than just using knowledge or con consuming knowledge. And um, the pedagogies, um, the pedagogies that we're looking at are. Um, going towards what people say learner autonomy how do you make learners become um, 
you know, masters of their own learning. Um, a lot of us are, are, are not comfortable with this. I have to, you know, um, uh, say this out because I, I also remind this in my, in my classes as well. Um, it, it's really easy to have teacher control classes because like what I'm doing with you right now, I'm controlling everything, you know, the, the input that you get from me. There's no interaction whatsoever in the session. Um, but then again, if this is a class, um, there should be some kind of a way that uh, we move away from um, the, the teacher or the facilitator providing all of the input for the class, but rather to, to, to get learners to be empowered, to be able to talk, yeah, to be able to um, take lead, to be responsible with their, with their own learning. Yeah? And, and this takes time for us to learn and, and to, um, uh, to build. And, and the way that we um, curate the, uh, the task, the assessment, has got to be about that towards learning engagement. So if you look at the Bloom's economy, and we are talking about the highest level of Bloom's economy, the revised one, not the old one, the revised one, um, it, which is creation. So the, the, the use of technology has got to enable this, this process of creation of knowledge. Yeah. So this is very... Um, you know, ideal is very idealistic. However, um, if it is curated properly, if we understand our content very well, and we have the language to present it well to the students, and that the students can actually articulate it in the way that they understand it, I think we have we have some miles to go. Um, and deep learning isn't isn't really about just thinking or reflecting. Um, on what has been learned, but rather it is um, an, an empowerment. This empowerment is what will drive um, students to move forward, uh, to become better in, in, in their understanding. And, and it's not just about being um, compliant or complacent yeah, in, in, in what they're learning. So it's not about finishing a syllabus, but rather to, to see if, if they finish this, what are the things that is beyond this that they are able to um, uh, achieve? So that's that's what we we, we look at when um, when we look at deep, deep learning. Yeah? And as I mentioned earlier, um, the elements in deep learning are actually things that we are already familiar with. Yeah, in PAK twenty one, um, the, the 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 four skills plus one, yeah, which is uh, nilai, is already there. Communication, critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving, creativity, all these things are already in our syllabus. But how far are we using it? Yeah, if you are an educator, how far are you actually using this? So um, we, we, we also have dialogues like this at, at the university um, to see how um, uh, our lecturers, our, our academic staff um, integrate this um, into teaching. How do we actually um, um, in instigate communication, effective communication in the classroom? How do we make sure that collaboration really works yeah, in the classroom? We, we can't just pair people up and, and, you know, for, for a task that is, which, which can be done by one person. So it requires a lot of thinking and planning and designing. Yeah, so um, in the afternoon, um, if you are joining us this afternoon, we would like to invite you to, um, to a game design sprint. Um, that we will um, introduce to you um, the way we can gamify um, learning content. So we'll share with you our experience, uh, what we know, and we hope that we'll be able to um, help you along the way in, in terms of seeing maybe um, a, a just you know an alternative way of of how you can present your content. And I think that that's the last slide. And um, thank you for um, being with us. Uh, this is. P3 and um, Kiman. Yeah, Kiman is here with me right next to me. And uh, we hope to see you again um, later this afternoon. Thank you. Can hear you.
hear me now? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so is it confirmed later on that it will be through Zoom, the afternoon session? I can't hear you. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. 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 We are having the session this afternoon in Zoom because uh, we would like people to break out and yeah. then we we'll come back again to um to see your idea pitch. So that's that's the plan for um this afternoon. We'll, so we'll the... send, yeah we'll send the details for the Zoom meeting um uh to the secretariat. Um, those of you who have already registered yesterday and the day before, uh, you should be getting the details in your email. Okay, so then we will con uh, continue with the idea pitch and flash uh, uh, through WebEx again. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah, do so, you want to do question and answer now, Leonard? Yeah, uh, so far we only have one question from Zalia. Uh, she said that uh, whether she, uh, she can get the slides uh, or not sure. for the sessions. <laughs> yeah. Sure, problem. Yeah. So yeah. We'll put We'll put the, the, the whole thing together on our website. Uh, we, have, we do have a, a website um, and also our Facebook page. So you can have access to all our materials. Yeah. And then uh, from Monira, Amir, uh, thank you for the uh, insightful session. I really enjoy it. Looking forward to the afternoon session. And then uh, Zulaika Yusuf, uh, thank you for the very interesting and insightful presentation on deep learning. Oh, uh, there's a question here uh, from Aliza Alexander. How do you, ACES, uh, tackle the challenges faced when it comes to utilizing technology resources in areas that have limited resources such as internet or gadgets? Ah, uh, um, that's a very good question. Um, to, to be honest, um, formally within this uh, project, we have not tackled this yet. Uh, we are still. Um, doing the theoretical um, investigations uh, we try to make sure that before we get to the ground we understand what we're doing yeah so um, this past um, nine months of the project we've been uh, working very closely with the uk team and also vietnam and indonesia to try to find um, uh, somewhat like a like a, a, a central um, construct yeah that we can uh, work towards um, and um, from our experience in previous projects, what we've seen is that um, the driver to this is in the way that um, teachers will take up, um, you know, the, the, the teaching. If the teachers are open towards, um, you know, flexible learning, uh, the teachers are open to try new things, I think that is already a first step uh, to making uh, things progress, in, even in remote rural uh, uh, communities. Um, we, we, we don't normally completely depend on IT, yeah? Um, but because in, in remote rural areas, um, you know, it's the access um, to IT is not really there. However, uh, we do find um, uh, ways to, to get teachers to think um, beyond what they're used to thinking. So like um, last year or the year before this, um, in 2019, we went to Long Lamai, um, which is uh, situated in Ulubaram. Um, there's no road connected to the to the community at all to the school, and uh, what we got was um, you know the, we had 18 teachers who were so enthusiastic to see how they can um, uh, 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 use um, different pedagogies in, to make their their uh, the, the, the teaching more interesting. So um, we got them you know their, their full attention in about one week that we sat with them and then we talked to them about you know, the problems that they were facing and then how um, they were going to um, address it and how uh, the pedagogical strategies can actually um, help to elevate um, the learning problems that they've already detected, uh, you know, among the students. So I think that works really well. And, and these are some, some things that um, um, I think has, has got to go on. Yeah? For, for those of you who are teaching in remote and rural areas, um, I think the key is to always be curious and to always want to do better, yeah, and that is really a first step towards uh, improving your your practice. Yeah. You want to answer this question? Um, I'll pass it off to JC. I think this question is for her. All right. 
we saw one question. Uh, I think everyone could see that the last question. By no Amira, uh, what are the current efforts done by educational institutions to tackle issues under the SDG? Uh, and what do you think is the best way to incorporate SDG awareness in education and also the public? Yeah, um, interestingly, again, very good question. Uh, when we saw this question, we are also having problems in the university. Okay, educational institutions may not are not even aware of SDG. So for them, SDG is like a KPI when it is not a KPI. It's a lot about sustaining. When 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 one says sustainability, the last the last the last the right? Yeah, the Malay word of it. It means it's a beyond. It's it's from the inner being that flows out. To the nature, to to the world, how things work in a whole ecosystem, and a lot of awareness has to be pushed. Uh, of course, again, with the KPI uh, in any institutions, uh, having to answer to the last ten years of the SDG, everyone is pushing it. But I think one has to the top management first has to reflect, go back one step. And reflect and really understand what SDGs actually uh, mean, and that includes actually uh, a lot of awareness. Uh, so some sort of like awareness that can be done that we are doing actually we will be doing in in the university. We still have a, a, a firstly a a dialogue session. Uh, we will have discussion with the top management, and then it trickles down to. Uh, the deans, the deputy deans, research team, and it doesn't stop there because not only the top management has to know about it, not only those who hold position has to know about it, it has to trickle down again to lecturers. Uh, it doesn't mean that lectures are of a lower level, but uh, in the case of university, but it has to be including them because they have to understand. Uh, what SDG in the, the philosophy behind SDG, and then the teachers or the lecturers can then pass down to students, and one would think, okay, that's it. No, it doesn't stop there again. Awareness has to trickle back to the administrative, the technical stuff, because you need to measure how much power is being used in the lab, in the whole building. How can we reduce? How can we effectively? reduce electricity. Uh, so these sort of uh, answers uh, can be captured from the technical staff, the administrative. So that includes the manager of course has to be aware of all this. So again, there is no one community uh, superior to only know what SDG is. So from students, when we have assignments, we bring students out to, this is before COVID, so you bring students out to the community, and then they will bring it back uh, to their family. And this is how the knowledge should actually pass down. Hence, the SDG doesn't take five years. It would exceed 2030, because it's a continuous continuum to actually help Earth, to make sure that Earth sustains for our next generation, and the generation more to come. So I hope I answer that uh, that question. Um, yeah. So if, if if there are small questions, you're free to to type it again. If I do miss out, uh, there is also another question. I I should get Lana to <laughs> the the chairperson to read it out. <laughs> I'm sorry because I, I don't get to see the question. I think they okay. probably All right. need to yeah. All right. I, I, I okay. So there there is one question from uh Eliza Alexander. Right. Uh question says, How do you uh ASAS tackle the challenges faced when it comes to oh yeah, when it comes to utilizing technology Oh, it has been answered. Thank you very much. Yes, I also want to add 
uh, on top of that, you know, like reading the question, that sometimes we are so engrossed with technology that we forgot that we can salvage what is there in the surrounding. Uh, we can take parts. We can be frugal. Uh, uh, frugal is the, the new in word. So we can use uh, leaves and stick or twigs and branches to still teach STEM or still still do some sort of innovation. Uh, I'm sure if you, you might have seen uh, how communities around the world have innovated uh, hand sanitizer, you know, like hand soap, water. They do not have the automatic hand sanitizer where it detects your fingers or your hand. But what they did was they just buy wood and they nail it and they create a whole system that links to food and water by not using their hands, but by using their feet. So that is uh, some sort of like social innovation that you can actually go Google. You can actually use what is around. And interestingly, we also talk a lot about play, the playful element, how we can include play. I'm sure in schools, with the schools that we have when, there is always board games that is available in a library or canteen, you know, a common area for, for students. But these board games has gone dusty. And it has, the box has been eaten by rats. So is there a way that we can utilize this? Because it's also going to, can we utilize the monopoly? Uh, what is that? Oh no, can we actually use it in teaching? Uh, I may say a lot about teaching uh, here, but you know I, I understand there are also industries. Can you use it as well in your training with managers, with subordinates? Uh, so there is a wide range of possibilities. I think one should not limit your capability. You just allow yourself to test it out. Then you know to the extent to when you can use it and when you cannot. So that's an addition to it. <laughs> uh, next question is Nora Mira. I think good. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, ah, by Adila Muhammad Hashim. Hello, tentang social innovation. Kita perlu ada kerjasama dari pihak luar. Bagaimana prosedur untuk mendapatkan kerjasama itu? Um, I'm not so sure if we have English speaking. Uh, so how do we, how do, how can we collaborate with uh, other agencies or other stakeholders when it comes to social innovation? Is there a prosedur that we can uh, have that sort of uh, collaboration? Uh, yes, uh, I would say yes, because there is an ecosystem, even in a university, uh, when we apply for funding, uh, the funding that we got is actually from the UK, but even with that, you see, we have to work with different stakeholders, we have to work with industries, we have to work with parents, different groups of communities, different groups of societies. Of course, there are procedures, uh, mainly cultural procedures. How do we come in to communities? So we need to understand the uh, cultural protocol as we meet uh, different group of communities, different groups of societies. Like how if we were to berhadap kepada yang di raja, and so there are protocols that we have to follow. So likewise, when we go into rural communities, there are also protocols. So we will meet the Council of Elders. We will meet the JKKK. In the case of Orang Asli, we will meet a lot of different stakeholders. So there's a lot of engagement. Oh, that's the word. There's a lot of engagement that has to come in before we can actually build the trust. And with the trust, we can now work together. All right. So, uh, 
we focus SDG, uh, of course, with the vision of uh, the country, uh, there are rules to allow collaboration to be done between universities, industry, not just that, community, not just that, policy, we need to influence, we need to inform policy, we need to make the betterment to our country. Yeah, so that's uh, some of the procedures, but if we do have uh, procedures or uh, informed policies that we have, we will definitely share it in our uh, Facebook, creativeculture.my. That is where we keep things posted, as well as uh, our Facebook. Facebook are a bit fast, so we tend to promote a lot of our events, as well as a quick update on certain things. Thank you for that question. Very good. I love all the questions. Uh, now let's see. Uh, we have answered all the questions, actually. Yay, we got someone from Kedah, very exotic. Uh, okay. We have a question from uh, Joshua Bell. Uh, okay. As a student, how do we implement STEM in our social circle? Can you repeat that again, please? As a student, how do we implement STEM in our social circle? In your social circle, all right. How do you implement STEM in your social circle? It depends on your social circle. You say peers among your schoolmates, for example. Uh, I have to look back when I was a student. Uh, there is a lot of grand challenge uh, that you get in Malaysia, even in Sarawak. You have the Young Innovate, you have the Ideaton, you have the Hackathon. So do and get involved with this. And there's, there's a lot of competition as well that is going on in the world. And mind you, because now with the pandemic, uh, no one is allowed to travel, which means you have access internationally. So you work together with your peers, apply, and go for competition. We at the uh, ACES research team, we would also be organizing uh, competition, grand challenge. But I don't want you to just wait for us, explore all the different competitions. And then when you explore the different competitions, try to understand what is required in all these competitions. Because different competitions have different expectations, different objectives. They may give you a certain sort of specific area that you need to solve. Then you need to learn to ask, why are we doing this? Why do we want to do this? What can we do? So the curiosity should spark. Always ask. You love to ask questions. Why when you were younger and your parents and your teachers will always tell you, shut up. But grand challenge to sort of competition is when you should take the opportunity to ask, what can you do? Why do we need to do this? What's wrong with climate change? So as you work on this, then you build. So it depends, again, on the competition. It could be using robotics. So then in any case of, uh, say, uh, the competition requires you to do a bit of programming, I'm sure the, the organizers would supply you with the necessary resources as you join the competition. So that's one way how you can work together with social innovation. And again, uh, when we talk about social innovation, you need to understand the needs of the society. If we talk about, um, say, for example, water quality, right? So if, if one, let's say, you get rainwater from rivers, and that is the only source of water, a drinking water, how can we come up with filters, the right sort of filters, for that specific river, because all rivers are not the same. All rivers have different sort of minerals, different pH. So what is the problem with the river? So these are the questions that you need to always ask. Work together with community, because one thing a lot of researchers do, not just students, not just anyone, even researchers, we forgot that the community 
has their own knowledge. They may see things. They even know there is climate change. They know the world is changing because they don't have enough durian. They don't have enough fruits. When fruits are first, when they're supposed to reap fruits, they get lesser reaps of fruits and they can't plant. So they knew something not going right. So the local communities have this knowledge. Talk to them. Have a, have a good engage with them. Have a good uh, conversation with them. Uh, build trust. Then you would collaborate. You see, it's a, it's a very simple ecosystem. And these are the simple processes. So you can work. And that could build your communication. And hopefully you can be an influencer. Right? Thank you. Hope I answer that question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jesse. Uh, so far, any other questions before uh, I probably will just have time to take the last question if there is? There is one by Hannah Priya Eddy. I received one. For teachers, how to integrate STEM learning in this new norm and what to do to spark my students' engagement in STEM learning? I'll get the education is to answer this. Uh, perhaps I can get uh, Dr. Petri, uh, an educationist, to answer this question. For teachers, get her to sit. Last question. Teachers have to integrate STEM learning in the new norm. How do I stop my students' engagement in STEM? Yep. Um, what are you teaching? May I ask? Um, Hanapia. Um, the um it, it depends obviously in the content that um uh, you're doing now um when when we teach online um they obviously there's a lot of things that you need to negotiate um you know you, you can't expect students um to be online completely you know throughout um, your class there will be times when um they will probably be engaged only with you for about 10 minutes but use that 10 minutes um, really really well um i would suggest like if you're talking about presenting just the content knowledge i would just pre-record or maybe ask them to watch um a, a video um or and, and but but when you you ask them to do those things um embed questions so as they are watching they are also made to think so from there you are already scaffolding the way that they're thinking um when um what do you call it when when you get them in the um the, the, the live sessions where you actually get to interact with them um it gives them things that they can show to you that they are doing something beyond what is normally expected yeah um, but this has got to be done in increment not not you know immediately oh i want you to create <laughs> um, something out of out of the blue. It has to be done in increment. So um, encourage that with the students, and and always always get them to talk with you, either um, uh, in writing or orally. Yeah, the best is if they can do it orally. But um, if you can't do it, you know, we we, we all have uh, limitations in terms of in terms of data and whatnot. Um, I would suggest like get them to um, uh, record. Yeah, I use Flipgrid a lot uh, for my classes, and and Flipgrid is 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 an, has a nice um, um, interface where um, students actually like it very well because um, it 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 complements um, what they see on Instagram. So you see all those filters in Instagram, you can see it as well in, in Flipgrid. So you can have um, all sorts of videos that that you know you can um, uh, cos cosmetic uh, you know fix you know, before you um, publish. So um, students seem to like uh, stuff like that. So at the same time, while you're teaching, um, I think it's also necessary to, um, to to find out what are the tools that will help you. Um, don't use the same tool all the time. Yeah, try to, you know, have a variation of, of things so that they, they don't really get bored, yeah? Um, uh, find, find something that you're comfortable with. I think that is the most important thing. I refer to um, Chua Man a lot. <laughs> In this in this department, and and um, he he knows a lot of tools, and and I do discuss with him like what what are the things that that work and didn't work, and I do make make an effort to try, um, but there are tools that he introduced to me that I completely oh my god I couldn't do this Kiman I keep on telling him that, so um you know find your comfort level, 
find what you're um, comfortable with because the students will detect if you are not comfortable. So um, be honest. There's another thing that I also learned from teaching online and particularly now that um, you know, you're, 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 you're not physically together with your students. Um, understand that um, they, they also want you um, to realize that they are facing difficulties, you know, at, at home is not like in the classroom. Um, you know, they have their, their siblings, they have their parents, they, God knows who else is in the, the house. Um, and it's not like in the classroom where it's the interaction is just between you and, 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 and the students. And, and um, this is something that I think um, we need to be um, a bit more empathic. Yeah, we listen a bit more. And I think we try to gauge like where is it that um, we we can push, yeah, and and where where in in, in which instance that we can pull, yeah, the the, the students into um the, the interactions. So again, interaction is the main thing, but the way that you manage or um, the way that you uh, make variations in the way that you interact is very very important. I hope that's um, useful. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vitri and uh, Dr. Jesse. So I think we are running uh, short of time now. So we should be going, heading for a uh, lunch break. And then uh, uh, please note that the two o'clock session uh, will commence with the uh, brain work uh, breakout, uh, which will be on Zoom. Yeah? For Zoom, uh, you can get the link uh, through the email that has been sent to you earlier. And then after the, the uh, framework uh, breakout session, then we will come back to uh, this WebEx session to, uh, to continue on Python Fish and Catch. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, thank you to all the presenters again and also to all the participants who stayed on until now. Uh, so uh, we will be back here. Uh, meanwhile, during the whole lunch break, we will be playing videos uh, from ACES. Uh, which you can view um, uh, throughout the, the whole uh, launch break. So, okay, thank you. <laughs>